message. It says to blow the trumpet, ring the bell, dress it up, make it safe. Fill it with rich, fill it with rich and well, and count the heads. We're doing well. But where's the faith? Read the creed and get it right. Hold it fast with all your might. Close the door and bolt it tight. We no need for further light. But where's the faith? Build a church and make it grow. Cushion pews in classic row. Made for comfort we love so. Come in, relax, enjoy the show. But where's the faith? Like James said, there's a whole lot of religious activity, but it's not a safety relationship of faith with our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the sick room, on the bed, invalid, helpless, but not dead, hear her pray through the pain. May my suffering be your gain. There's the faith. Here a loving mother gives, with all the reason that she lives, to strive against unnumbered odds and bring her children to know God. There's the faith. Surprising in it, when the faith is found, not where reigns the world renowned, but in the den of work and strife, where the cross meets daily life. There's the faith. Amen. I entitled this message the P90X Gospel. Now, there's no such thing as a P90X Gospel. That's the title of the message. But this is how God gave it to me. Uh, months ago, when I first uh, went to work there at Honda, uh, like a lot of us, I'm saying, I need to lose some weight. And uh, so the guys, uh, several guys and my friends were there, they began to tell me that they, y'all, how many ever seen P90X advertised on television? So, exercise, disc. And they said that they, them and two others, there was three of them, took the challenge of when they first started working with Honda, they bought the P90X program. And they, they used words like this to describe it, brutal. They said it was brutal. There was three of them that bought the program. Two of them did it. One of them said that he went home, him and his wife put it on, sat on the couch, and he said it wore me out watching it. The first one just wore me completely out watching it. <laughs> he didn't do it. They did it. Now, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it because this has nothing to do with P90X. I'm not trying to get you to buy an exercise program. But P90X is for people who are in really, really good shape. Okay? Because they, they, they give you a physical fitness thing that you have to do, and if you can't pass it, they tell you not to order it. They have something a little easier that you might start with that hopefully you can build up to it. Uh, the claim is, and it's, they say it's absolutely true, that if you do the program, it's about an hour and a half of exercise and 30 minutes of stretching, six days a week for nine days, and take one day off. You can stretch on that day, they allow you to do that. But they say it is the most brutal, intense thing that you will ever do. And one of the reasons for that is they use muscle confusion uh, techniques. And what that means is that you never get into a comfort zone. Once your muscles, how do you know if you do a certain thing over and over again, your muscles build to that level and then they kind of stop. But you can do whatever you're doing at that level, keep doing it. You just don't get stronger. Everybody say you just don't get stronger. You can do that. So if you lift, if you get where you lift 250 pounds, if you don't go beyond 250 or try to change up some things, you're going to be able to lift 250, but you're not going to grow, you're not going to be strong. So P90X, to make sure that don't happen, they constantly are changing the exercises to where you're constantly sore, you're constantly building, building muscle. Now, you say, what in the world has that got to do with the gospel? So I was sitting there the other day, I hadn't thought any more about that uh, since that first conversation way back when I first started. But the other, other day, we were in the lunchroom again, and uh, this week I chose just not to eat in the lunchroom. And so they were kidding me about it. They always kid me about my diet and all that good stuff, you know, all this weird stuff. But, but they, uh, they was kidding me. They said, well, you know what? If you do P90X, you could eat all, all this stuff we're eating, and you still wouldn't gain weight. I said, you're right. Well, I went back to my process and I began to think of it. The Lord began to speak to me. The Lord said, the church is weak. The Lord said, my, my church is very comfortable with certain aspects of my word because that's all they hear. That's all they want to hear. Right? But other aspects of my word they're not hearing and therefore they're stuck and they're not growing. Now, last week, you know, I talked about 
uh, the need for Christians to read and study the Word of God. Yeah. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, it went over like a lead balloon. Now, you may say, well, I, I listened. You didn't receive. <laughs> you know, some people are very, uh, if you want to grow in Christ, you're not going to grow past, past your dedication to several things. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to learn to pray if you're going to grow in Christ. And you're going to have to dig into that Word. The Bible is not a book that you read one time and you're done. The, book, the Bible is a dimensional book. You read it in dimensions. And a lot of it comes down to when you come to a place where you realize you don't know much. And a few months ago, I came to the same place I was when I first gave my heart back to the Lord in 1986. I got before the Lord and I said, God, I'm ignorant. I said, I, this, this, I don't really know. I don't, I don't really know your word like I should. I'm ignorant. Now, with that said, I probably read the Bible more than any I'll put together in this room. Because of time. I had time. And I took advantage of time. I've studied it probably more than all of you. Because of time. Not because I'm smarter or better or anything like that. Just because simply I had time. And I did. And I took advantage of that time. But I've come to the place now where every time I open the book, it's a new book. Every time I open it, I'm seeing things I never saw before. In the simplest things, there's depth there. You know, I, we begin to pray. We begin to pray with the prophecy given on this house. And one of those prophecies was we would walk in new dimensions, new dimensions. And I got honest with God. I said, God, I don't even know, know what a dimension is. I've let alone how to walk in them. And God began to speak to me. He said, The dimensions, the open doorway to the dimensions are found within my word. He said, My word has deeper dimensions when you begin to read with understanding. You know, we talked about that in Sunday school. Uh, Spirit-filled people have a tendency to divorce their mind. You know, we're moved by our emotions, or, and that's part of being spirit-filled. That's right. We, we know we don't have to do away with emotion. We can have emotion. But we never get to the place where we divorce our minds. God is a God of reason. The Bible says, God says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. What did God said? Come reason with me. Come think with me. Come think like God. So we want to get into this P90X gospel. Having only one side of truth weakens us and warps our ability to discern and clearly hear the voice of God. How many of you know that? If all you're told is that God is such a loving, wonderful, marvelous God, and all he needs to do is just bless, 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 bless you, when he speaks to you outside of that confinement of your theology, you will not hear his voice. You will actually turn and refuse Satan. God is a God of warning. How many know God warns? Yeah. And yet people are, it amazes me how people ignore the warnings of God. How many of you know that over and over in the Bible it says, be not deceived? But yet I hear Christians say, well, I'm just trusting God and I'm not going to be deceived. Well, if, if you're trusting God, why did God say be not deceived? Why did God give you a command not to be deceived? If he's going to make sure you're not deceived and you don't have anything to do with it, then there's, why would God even bother to put that in the Bible? So if you're not going to be deceived, you're going to have to do something. Now, if you're saying, I'm trusting God that, that as I walk with him in obedience and as I search the scriptures to find out that things are true and as I walk in discernment before God, I'm trusting in him that he's going to help me not to be deceived that I'm on board. But if you're just careless, you don't study the word, you don't understand anything that's before you in a discerning way and have any scripture for it or understand what's being said from the scriptures or that they're being twisted and you're saying, well, I'm just trusting God, I'm not going to be deceived. You're going to be deceived. Everybody say, I'm going to be deceived. Because be you didn't do your job. You didn't do what God said. See, we, we're, we're running around thinking that the gospel don't work. Right now, the church has been taught prosperity by the brightest and best, and by, the, by and large, for the most part, there are people who are succeeding, but by and large, for the most part, the church is poorer than it's ever been. We're more broke than we've ever been. Health and healing from the scriptures is taught more than it has ever been taught, and yet, by and large, in churches, spirit-filled churches, where healing is taught, we're sicker.
that we've ever been. So God didn't lie. Maybe we're not reading everything we should have read. How many know that there's 3,000 promises? We're good on promises. We're not good on being the condition of the promise. With each one of those promises, there is condition. Right? We talk about the God of covenant. We're all about covenant. But most people don't understand a covenant cuts both ways. If my enemies are God's enemies, guess what that means? God's enemies are mine. Everybody say, God's enemies are mine. God's enemies are mine. God has a very powerful enemy. His name is the enemy. Guess what? He's my enemy. Everybody who opposes the ways of God becomes my enemy. And God does expect me in covenant to stand with his word. God said, if you're ashamed of me and my words, I'll be ashamed of you. So if we want covenant to work, we've got to get into the covenant too. We've got to do covenant things. And part of being in covenant with God is understanding and learning his word. We have to. Amen. The world has, to this point, had more influence upon the church than the church has had upon the world. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Folks, we're not influencing them. Not very well. There may be pockets. I'm not saying the church is perfect. It's not. But by and large, the church in America, as far as a lot of things, just doesn't matter. It doesn't factor in. Right? right? We look around. I mean, our school system used to never do certain things on certain days because of the church. Right. Wednesday nights was reserved for the church. The schools knew you don't do anything <coughs> on Wednesday. It's church night. Don't, that don't even factor in anymore. Let me tell you something. Schools are getting more their factor than Sunday out there. Yeah. You know, they schedule events on Sunday, just like any other day now. Why? Because the church doesn't factor in. And as long as the church goes along with it, it'll, it'll, it won't factor in. Amen? Amen? For instance, our gospel has become very politically correct in that we do not want to make anyone uncomfortable in church for fear of offending them. Why? You can't talk about homosexuality in church. I'm not a homophobe. I don't hate homosexuals. But I hate to tell you this, but God says it is sin. Yes. He says sexual sin of any kind. Heterosexual, adultery is sin. Fornication yes. is sin. Pornography is sin. All these sexual things are sin, but we can't talk about them because, lo and behold, we want people to be comfortable. We want to give them the good news. Well, the good news is if you're involved in those sins that the power of the gospel can bring you out and set you free. Amen. That's the good news. Yes. Not that he leaves you in that mess. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It's deliverance. It brings us out. It repeats. But if we never tell the side, if we never tell people it's sin, then there's no reason to come out. That's right. We live in America where there is a church for every persuasion. Right? Because of this polit political correctness, we preach on the quote good stuff, but leave out the quote offensive stuff, and therefore our therefore our growth is stunted, and we are spiritually weakened. So I was asking the Lord, okay, why P ninety X? What's it? I mean, why? What are you saying? And the Lord says, my scriptures are designed, son. If you notice that I give you a promise and a condition. And for every situation in your life, there is a promise and there is a condition. And said, when you're building, you're going after me and you're going after everything I have for your life, you will grow because you're going to heed everything I say. And as you heed everything I say, you're going to build spiritual muscle. How many know you are a spirit? But if you stepped outside of your body, your spirit man would look exactly like your physical man. We would know you. We have ridiculous ideals. I hear people talk about when they get to heaven, we're going to be like little vapors floating around. No, you're going to look like you up there. I'm going to know you. You're going to know me. We're going to look like we look here, except without the imperfections and all those things. I hear people talk about when we get to heaven, we're going to be sexless. 
We're going to be like the angels. Well, the angels ain't set for us. How many of you know that? They're not. They're male. Everybody say they're male. They're male. They're male. Okay. So we're not going to be, you know, like that. Why? Where do we get these ideals from? We get them because we don't read what? The Word of God. We don't read it. We don't study it. We don't do it. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Let's stop right there. It says, since you have become. In other words, the author of Hebrews said, there was a time you were not dull of hearing, but now you have become dull of hearing. Can I say some things? Most of us, when we first were born again, first received the Holy Ghost, there was a time when man, we went after God with everything we had. There were times that Bible study was not a drudgery. Amen. There was times when you called a prayer meeting, people didn't avoid it at all costs. They wanted to be together with other believers, spending time in the presence of God and going after God. Now, I realize some of that might have been a little crazy, some of it might have been a little radical, but you have to admit you were on fire for Jesus. And that book left off the pages. It got inside of you. You went out and you talked about it. You were excited about it. You were growing in grace. But somewhere along the lines, we begin to neglect certain things like the word, like prayer, and we became dull of hearing. What does it mean to be dull of hearing? It means you're not hearing God. Everybody said, it means you're not hearing God. Now, the Bible, now, you're going to say, the Bible says my sheep hear his voice. My sheep have the ability to hear his voice. You're right. But you can become what? Dull of hearing. See, everybody says, well, I'm a sheep. I hear his voice. Well, did you read the part about you can become dull? Did you read the part that you can get to a place where you can't? Did you read the part where your heart can be hardened in sin and not even hear him at all? That's in there, too. Everybody said that's in there too. That's P90X, strengthening your muscle. It's getting you out of your comfort zone, realizing you have a responsibility for your growth. You have a responsibility for God. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. Everybody said again. Again. What it means is they had been taught before. You knew this stuff. This was things you already knew, but something happened, and now we're having to go back and do this teaching all over again. That's what the writer is saying. Everybody say, that's what he's saying. Remember, engage your mind here. Engage your mind. We're not, you know, we're not doing the spirit field thing right now. We're not falling out the floor. We're not doing anything. Let me tell you something. Go through the book of Acts and see how many times Paul, after they fell out the floor and after they had the miracles, they went and they went into somebody's house and they studied the scriptures daily. Every single day. Study the scriptures. Why? Because God wants you to have it all. You don't have to have one and not the other. You're, if you want to grow, you want to see signs, wonders, and miracles, study the Word. Know what the Word says and live in line and in accordance with it. That's what we're going to have to do. You have come teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Notice it said you come to need milk. What that means is there was a time you didn't need it. There was a time you had grown. There was a time you could eat solid food. But now you can't. Now we got to go back and we got to get you back on milk. Because you let some things slip. Everybody said, we let things slip. The Bible says, be careful not to let the revelation you receive slip. Why does God want us not to let it slip? Because we can let it slip. Everybody says, we can let it slip. See, some of you won't, you, 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 I stand up, I start to teach some, you say, oh, I already, I already know that. Well, why does God have me teach you again? Brother Lee, you don't need to teach me about faith. I read every book Brother Hank wrote. I don't need that. 
And what did you do? Because God brought it back up. Maybe you let the revelation slip. Is that possible? Is it possible we let the See, you don't have to answer it because God's already said it is. And I would believe him. He said, be careful that you do not. Now, if you're not careful, what's going to happen? Be careful that you do not let the revelation move sleep. You'll receive sleep. So if you're not careful, what's going to happen to the revelation? It's going you're going to let it slip. Remember, we're engaging our minds. If you went to anything, say you went to a seminar where they were teaching you how to, how to make money, you're going to have your notepad, you're going to have your recorder, you're going to have everything, you're going to go with that thing with a fine tooth comb for the why it's about money. And all the hard stuff, all that stuff is real company. You're going to make sure you thoroughly understand it, and you're going to make sure you do it, especially if the man says, now be careful you don't do this, X with your money, because you will lose your money. Be careful not to do X with your money because you will lose your money. What are you going to be? What are you going to do? You're going to be very careful because you don't want to lose your money. But when God says be careful not to let the revelation slip, we're going to be careful. See, that's why I said we got to read the whole. See, we call ourselves what? Full gospel. What that means is, we remember that? We're full gospel. We teach the full gospel. What that means is we teach you about divine healing and we teach you prosperity. Can I tell you something? The full gospel is not being taught in church anymore. We're teaching you, yeah, we're teaching you to prosper. We're teaching you to heal. The whole, the whole gospel is a whole lot more than that. If you go on Wednesday nights and you go through that book of Philippians like you're doing it verse by verse, I mean, you know, God has a lot of warnings. Mm hmm. God has a lot of you need to treat each other certain ways. And if you don't, this is going to happen. Right? So we have to be careful. For everyone who partakes only, and that's metallicized, so let's just eliminate that. For anyone who partakes of, it says milk, he is italicized, unskilled in the word of of righteousness. Now, if you get to the place you can't take solid food, what is solid food? Solid food has to be digested. Solid food has to be prepared. If you just go to the refrigerator and get your meal, you're not warming up meal food. But it's easy. You just get it. Solid food, you gotta prepare it. You gotta chew it, and you gotta digest it. But guess what? You can go with the strength of it for a while. It will keep you healthy. Solid food is not ice cream all the time. Solid food is not giving you payday, your, 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 your uh, Snickers bar every day. Solid food is stuff that, you know what? You might not necessarily find the most exquisite. I mean, you know, when you go to a fancy restaurant and you pay 150 bucks, you don't get 10 toe beans and turnip greens. Right? But let me tell you something. Pinto beans are good for you. Turnip greens are good. They're full with all kinds of nutrients that your body needs. Guess what? The Bible's got some stuff in here that is not easily palatable. It's not sweet. It's not going to make you jump, holler, and run the aisles. But baby, it will make you healthy, and it will make you strong, and you will grow if you need it. When it says don't treat people this way, guess what? You'll save yourself a whole lot of grief if you don't treat them that way. Amen. Right? And you'll make for a more peaceful thing because God's telling you what not to do. Amen? The Bible is a lot about what God don't want you to do. Now, why don't God want you to do it? Because it's bad for you. It's bad for you. We use this illustration over and over again. If, if you're going around a curve and you see a sign, bridge out. And man, it's been raining and there's flood waters flowing there. How many, how many of you know that that sign is gospel? It's good news. It is to prevent you from dying. Amen. It is to cause you to slow down. But you know what happens in the Spirit-filled church? Well, you know, I, I know God said to do that. 
I know God warned me not to. But you know what? I just believe the, the Spirit of God. Well, the Spirit of God is there is liberty. There's liberty. We shouldn't be in bondage. We shouldn't have to heed a warning sign. Well, you're going to die. You're going to die. Everybody say, I'm going to die. You're not heeding the warning sign. And over and over in scriptures, you hear this word in the Bible, warning. The Bible said in the last days, and guess what? We've all come to know something. We're in the last day. Okay? When that Bible was written, that was the last days. He wrote it 2,000 years ago, so guess what? You found the last day. He said in the last days, men will heap up for themselves, talking to the church, church, men who will teach them doctrines of the Jews, what they want to hear. You've got to learn to discern, and I'm not talking about being suspicious. Trying to figure out what you what sin your brother and sister is doing. Let me tell you something. God may, God may tell some people that, but if you one of the people that's going to pick up the phone and say, you know what God showed me that sister so and so, then you may get something, but it ain't from the God I serve. That's right. Amen. It's not from the God I serve. I'm going to say it again. It ain't from the God I serve. Let me tell you something. If God shows you something about your brothers and sisters, number one, you better be humble enough to make sure that you understand you may have missed it. That's right. And number two, it's for you to get in your prayer closet and pray for not another human ear ever hear other than yours. That's right. Because God will not give that to people we cannot trust. Amen. Right. And if I can't trust you, come on, I'm going to say, I'm going to get one of you y'all this morning. If I can't trust you, God can't trust you. Yeah. If I wouldn't share something with you because I know that if I shared it with you, the whole church would know it, then God's smarter than I am. God's smarter than I am. If I'm smart enough to know it, you better believe God's smart enough to know it. Amen. Now, if you've ever done that, repent. Tell God you're going to become trustworthy. But if you, here, let me help you. If your desire to know things from God is to know things about other people, then you're not ready for those gifts. And God will give them to you. That's right. Why do you want to know somebody else's business? The Bible says don't be a... Here, y'all want to hear something that's in the Bible that you don't hear preached a lot? You know the Bible says don't be a busybody in other men's affairs? How do you know that's in the Bible? God said, mind your own business. Let's break it down in Alabama terms. Get out of my business and mind yours. Amen. That's in the Bible. Everybody said that's in the Bible. That's right. God wants you to mind your affairs. Why? Because if you get if you get focus on your business, you'll find out you've got plenty of things to, to work out. Mm -hmm. to, then we can begin to work and help each other. Right? Because once you work through your mess, you're going to be very humble. About somebody else's mess. Mm -hmm. You know? We'll say this. I'm preaching better than you're receiving. I'm going to say this. You can say it's meddling or whatever. But you ain't got no, no right to tell anybody else how to raise their kids. Mm -hmm. They're their kids. They're not yours. One thing I'm not going to do, I've never had a child, I'm not going to tell you how to raise one. Right. Now, if they come to church, I want to tell you to make sure they behave in this house. Mm -hmm. I ain't telling you how to raise them. I tell them they're in, they're in the house of God. You've got to teach them how to behave here. Right. That's sort of what? Right. Just like if they go to school, you don't get mad at that teacher when she calls you up and say, Your little kid is misbehaving. No, you give them a spanking. But the pastor, oh God, if he dares says that your child is studying up, he just made me don't understand. We have liberty. Mm -hmm. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. <laughs> Yeah, there's liberty, but there ain't mass confusion. Amen. Not mass confusion, it's liberty. Amen? But solid food belongs to those. Everybody say, solid food belongs to those. Solid food belongs to those. Who are full age. Who are full age. In other words, you're supposed to grow. When you get born again, you're supposed to be in a place of continual growth. Amen? That is... 
those who by reason of use had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, let's think about it. Good and evil should be easy to discern, right? So why is God saying, I've got to exercise my senses? Now, he's not just talking about your physical senses. He's talking about your spiritual senses. Because <coughs> you're a spirit man. Guess what? You have spirit smell. Some of you have smelled that. You have smelled the shepherd at times. The rose of Sharon. You smell it. How many of you have ever been in service and you can smell that aroma of him? That's your spiritual nose. How many of you, Brother Andy, heard that door slam? It means you have a spiritual ear. How many of you ever woke up at night? God's woke you up because you heard something. Yeah. And then you realize it wasn't physical. But it sounded like it. Why? Because your spirit man never sleeps. He's just like God. You are a spirit. You never slumber. He's always speaking to you. He's always dealing with your heart. You have spirits, that, but you have to exercise them to discern between good and evil. What was that tree in the garden that God said don't eat from? Anybody know? What was his name? The knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, why in the world would God not want man to know good and evil? Remember how God said the moment you eat it, you're going to die. So discerning good and evil may not be as easy as we think it is. Good can be the enemy of God. Let me say that again. Good can be the enemy of God. And what looks good in the moment may not be good 10 years down the road. Let's take the Apostle Paul. We studied the book of Galatians. Y'all went through that, right? The book of Galatians is about Paul talking to the church at Galatia about the Judaizers. The Judaizers were Jewish believers who accepted Christ. The Jewish believers came to the Gentile believers and said, You're saved, that's great, but if you're really going to be saved, you've got to be circumcised. And you got to keep the law. And here's the good thing about that. If you do that, there will be no conflict between us and you. Because you'll be just like us. And we'll all get along. And you won't have this offense of the cross. Because what you're doing is offensive to us. Sounds good, right? Church unity. Paul said it's not good. Paul said he withstood them to the face. It was so bad in Paul's eyes that they went to the council in Jerusalem and put it before the elders and the apostles because it looked good, but what had happened, if that had been allowed, the church would have just become another sect of Judaism. Because see, Paul discerned. He exercised. He had use of his senses. He was a full age, and he looked at a thing. How many of your children come to you and they ask for something? It sounds like it's harmless money. It's a good thing, as a matter of fact. But you know if you give it to them, it's going to mess them up down the road. Mom and Daddy have to be not like all the other mom and daddy. They, they're not, they're mom and daddy. Let them go down there and hang out at night in the park. <laughs> their mom and daddies are their friends. You treat me like I'm a Mr. Child. Because you are, because we have responsibility to you, and we know that no good thing is going to happen with a bunch of kids in a park at night with no adult supervision. So you're not going. Do you do that? Why do you do that? Because you're older, you have discerned, you have exercised, you know some things, and so you put some rules on them. God wants us to be like that. God wants us to become a full age, to discern some things. Let's listen to this. Let's look, let's look at some scriptures real quick. This ain't going to be a long message. Then we're going to pray. 1 Samuel 15, 23 says this, For rebellion is as the palisades. So that means it was added. For rebellion, the sin of witchcraft. You know what rebellion is? It's when you don't do what God tells you to do. Everybody say rebellion is when I don't do what God tells me to do. Simple. And stubbornness. 
You know, see, we, we, all, we always talk about that rebellion and witchcraft, but we don't talk about stubbornness. Right. Stubbornness is not a virtue. Right. God says it's not a virtue. God says, and stubbornness, again, is, act, is as is italicized, stubbornness, iniquity, and idolatry. See, when you're so stubborn, you won't do it God's way. Or any other body, or any other, nobody else's body. That's iniquity and it's idolatry. It means I'm God. I said the standard. God don't matter. God does matter. Because you have rejected, listen to this, what did they reject? The word of the Lord. Look at the Logos. Go back to that one up there uh, in uh, Peter. Uh, Hebrews 5 11, it says the word of righteousness, that word is logos. The other written down inspired. Logos of righteousness, of what it means to have a right standing with God. God said, I will withhold no good thing from those who walk upright. Now, if you use your mind, what does that tell us? You do right. What pleases God, God is not going to withhold anything that is good. God knows good. What good is really good. God, He's going to give it to you. But what does it also tell you? If you don't walk with right, good will be withheld from you. We don't like that. We're charismatic, Pentecostal. But no, God promised it that if I walk up right, nothing good is going to be withheld from me. Well, you gotta walk upright. Well, I just don't believe God is that restrictive. Yes, He is. So you may tell your child, if you don't do your chores, I'm not going to give you let you go to the movies or whatever. But then they come to you and they play on your sympathies and you let them go. You lie. God don't. So, if you want nothing good withheld from you, you have to walk upright in what is God's sight. Because if you don't, there's going to be some good withheld. So what does that tell us? That means that the children of God who really go after God, really want to walk right, really want to please God, they're going to get some stuff that those children who don't are not going to get. The Bible says... God rewards those who diligently, remember this is, this is God working with muscle confusion here. God's helping you to grow. God's helping to strengthen you. God rewards those who diligently, earnestly seeking. What does that tell you? That reward, that word reward means it pays you wages. It means if you don't diligently seek him, you're going to miss a payday. Everybody say, I'm going to miss the yeah. I'm going to say this again. This didn't work last week. I'm going to say it again. If you don't study this book, if you don't get in this book and study it, study it, study it, did not seek him. Because this is where he's found. You say, well, Brother Lee, you know, I, I, I remember this years ago. See, this only happens in Pentecostal churches. We want to have the Spirit without the word. There's actually arguments. I remember Rick Joyner dealing with this years ago in the book I read. Rick Joyner said this woman came to him and she said, well, if I was walking through a minefield, I would want to hear the voice of God. I'd want the Holy Spirit to show me, don't step here, don't step there. Her argument was, I don't need the word, I just need the Holy Spirit. Brother Rick Joyner in the wisdom of God said, you know what I'd like to have? I'd like to have a map and the voice. This is the map. If you didn't have the voice, you'd still make it with the map. If you have the voice only, you got to make sure you really know that voice. See, we used to say this, y'all heard this, if you have the word without the spirit, you what? Drive. If you have the spirit without the word, you what? You blow up. God don't want you to have either or. God wants you to have both. The Word 
and the Spirit. How are you going to test the Spirit? The Bible tells us to test the Spirit. How do we do that apart from the Word of God? How do we discern truth apart from the Word of God? How do we discern good and evil apart from knowing God's thoughts? See, if somebody comes to you and says, I can live any kind of way because I'm under grace. God doesn't require me to keep all those stringent rules. I go to church when I feel like going to church. You know what? I just, me, and, me and God, we just decided to go to the beach today. We hung out. We had a good time. Oh, man, it was just marvelous. Me and Jesus at the beach ball. They go there next Sunday, and they go there every Sunday. They don't go to church, but yet they tell you they're saved. God is blessing them. You know what? We know that's not true. Because you're not diligently seeking Him. Because I guarantee you, when you was on the beach with your beach ball, you didn't have your Bible up, you wouldn't hear the word of correction, you wouldn't hear anything but what you told yourself you wanted to hear. And stubbornness is the big belief in us all. And you're just stubborn. You don't want to go to God's house. Because you don't want to be challenged. You don't want somebody to tell you that you're crazy the way of thinking is crazy. Amen. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, everybody say that's a command. Don't say that about the command. It's a command, it's not a suggestion. All deceit, hypocrisy, Envy and all evil speaking. Oh man, God is so restrictive. God is so restrictive. I thought with the Spirit of the Lord is there liberty. Yes, the liberty is I'm delivered from that. I'm delivered. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built on a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up, everybody say this, spiritual sacrifices. Acceptable. What's acceptable for you may not be acceptable to him. Through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble. Why? Listen to this. Why do they stumble? Being disobedient to the Logos word to which they also were appointed. Church, there's nothing good will ever come into your life by disobeying God's word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Nothing. Amen. Nothing good is going to happen to you by disobeying God. When God says to do a thing, it is for your good. Just like you tell your children to do things they do not want to do. But it's for their good. Right? It's for their good. You do it because you love them. You do it because you're responsible for them. God does it because He loves us and He's responsible for us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Paul talked to his son Timothy, reminded him of these things, charging him before the Lord not to strive, not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the years. Be diligent. The Bible, the King James says, study. You look it up, it means be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So let's take this and break it down. You want to be approved of God. You want to work for God. If I say, I want to work for God. I want to work for God. I want to do something for God. God's telling you, you want to be a, God said, I'm not just going to let anybody work for me. Did you notice God said approved? You have to be approved. In other words, like if you go into, like on some of your jobs and stuff, you know what, before you can move up to the next level, 
you had to prove that you were competent at the level you were at. And then they would test you to see if you had a, uh, you know, a capacity to move to the next level. Then you had to learn certain things. And then they would say, okay, we're going to let you move into this position. You had to be approved, right? God said, you got to be, you going to work for me? i got to prove you. See, a lot of people say they're working for God. They're not working for God because they're not approved. They don't know squat. They don't know nothing. I read Facebook. I see some of the most ridiculous, insane posts by people who are supposed to be Christians. They share their opinion as if it were verse, chapter and verse. They give an opinion. And people don't say, amen, praise God. That, that, I know that's what the Lord said. No, he didn't. We're, give, give me a chapter. Give me a verse. Show me where God said that. He didn't say it. And yet people are not approved. And yet they're out there working, laboring in the fields. You may have you may looked at the job, but guess what? You're not approved. You're not getting a paycheck. You're not on the payroll. Everybody say, I love you, brother. I love you, brother Lee. This is good stuff. I'm so glad you're telling me that this morning. I just, it just makes me want to run out. No, it don't. It don't make me want to run out. Let me tell you something. It's good for you. It's good for you. But you need to know this. We need to know this. We got people that's not here this morning because guess what? They just tried it out to. Why, why do they make decisions like that? Because they haven't read a book. If they have, they forgot it. They let some things slip. There was a time they wouldn't have, they would not have missed, but they've let revelation slip. Things have changed in their life. They let things slip. Because why? We're, we're just told how wonderful we are and how much God loves us. Oh, he would never whip you. Oh, yes, he would. Mm -hmm. He's a good father. Absolutely. He's a good father. Brother Lee, you just don't know what I'm, I, I'm going through. My finances are a mess. Yeah, you disobeyed God. They're a mess. And you want him to clean up the mess, but you're still disobeying, still doing the same stupid stuff that got you in the mess. Do you know that in the Bible it tells you not to that borrow money you cannot pay back? That's a principle. The principle is this the borrower is servant, a slave to who? The lender. The lender. Now, we're not saying you can't ever borrow money. I'm not saying that. What we're saying is the Bible teaches you, though. Look, I, 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 look, y'all know I love you. Y'all know I'm trying to add money. Let me tell you something. I've been tired of ever since I really got born again. Tired of that always. But let me tell you something. I wrecked my finances. I guess what? What did I do? Disobey God's word. Borrowed more than I just pay back. Now, I haven't paid back. I go bankrupt. Got to pay it back. All right? But did God love me? Yes, he did. Did God bless me as much as he could? Am I paying for my stupidity? You better believe it. And yet I have people in this house that go to pay their loans. Can I tell you that is not your most brilliant move? They will eat you alive and spit you out. Yes. There are people that give their whole social security check every month to pay their loan. And they go in there and borrow money. Mm -hmm. I read an article in the, uh, about a man in Silicon that had, he literally every month went to pay their loan and gave his social security check. And then borrowed money to live on. They 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 figured up the interest, how long it was going to take you. This is a 65, 70 year old man. You know how long it was going to take him to pay all that long? 35 years. Now they know he's not going to live 35 years, but they also know they're making their money hand over fist every single month he shows up. Because he probably borrowed about a hundred dollars in the beginning. And now he's a slave to the lender. Is that God's will for that man? Yeah. And guess what? We can be a believer, but if we violate the word, we live like an unbeliever. So 
Somebody say, I'm glad you're telling me this. I don't want to hear it, but I'm glad you're telling me this. I'm glad you're telling me this. Bible, God don't want you to live to meet the privilege. God wants you to have the promises and the blessings. But us running around here being crazy charismatics, oh, praise God, there is liberty, liberty. I can just go out and just run that credit card up and bless God. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. No, your righteous money is laid up for the wicked down to pay that long, but you got to pay that money back. Well, they're going to ruin your little credit, your little name, and everything. You write us a title check, finally, after all 20 years of robbing God, it's going to bounce. Jerry's a treasure. Where did that title kind of check bounce? I went to a few and prayed it didn't bounce. And it didn't, but man, it's happened. It's happened. And you know what happens when people do that? They're so desperate that they finally say, well, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Now, I'm going to walk. Brother Andy, we're out there, so I'm going out there, okay? Is that all right, Ellen? Can we just go on out there? Some of y'all have been following God for 30 years, and now you come up to me and say, I'm going to start doing it right. I'm going to start right now. Well, yeah, you should. Because you wrecked it by disobeying him. Thank God you're finally getting it right. But guess what? You're, that, that 20 years you robbed him is still out there. It's going to take a while to turn the ship around, and when you don't win that publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes, and you quit tithing again, which is what you do when God don't come through like an armored truck back up and just dump money on you, you quit tithing. Tithing is what you do because you're in covenant with the Holy God. Amen. You, manage it. you don't do it because he promised to make you rich. Nowhere in there does it promise you anything about money, necessarily. He promises you he will bless you. Money is part of that blessing. But I can promise you this. Everybody point to your brain. If God says, if you bring the tithe into the storehouse, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour blessings into your life that you cannot even contain. Amen. What happens if you don't? You don't get the blessings. What happens if you don't do that? Those windows are not open. Those windows do not get open. See, God is just. God is holy. God is righteous. God don't lie. God cannot bless if you're not the tither. God can't bless you the same way he does the tither and be just. Right? If God makes a promise to you because you tithe, he can't bless you the same way if you don't. And he won't. Because why? God don't lie. See, we say, man, his word is eternal, his word is sure, and I'm standing on the promises of God. Yes. But you got to stand on the whole thing. You've got to have that muscle inversion, that muscle confusion. You've got to hear what's not necessarily sweet and palatable and that will sell on PDM next week. Because nobody's going to sign up for the page that tells you you're wrong. But let me tell you something. If you really want to live holy and right and get right with God, you got to find out what you're doing wrong and correct it. Amen. And if everybody's telling you that you're not doing nothing wrong, then you'll keep doing wrong and you'll keep getting wrong results. And then you'll get to where you doubt with God. You wouldn't trust him because you think that he lied to you. He didn't lie. You just didn't do what he said. God does want you to promise. God does want you to be prosperous. God says he make it rich and add no sorrow with it. But also, it, listen to this, listen to this. In all labor, there is profit. We're thinking this morning, what happens if you don't labor? No what happens if you don't labor? You don't profit. Y'all know I'm not real political, but if you want to elect, it, you know, <laughs> they'll give you a thousand dollars a month, right? They'll raise your taxes twelve hundred dollars to give you that thousand dollars a month, right? We don't think. We don't think. We got people lying and promising you the moon, right? I'm going to get a check. We'll just we'll, we'll make all the rich people pay all the taxes.
taxes. Can I tell you something? They're not telling you. If you're rich, you can move. Everybody say, if I'm rich, I can move. If I'm rich, I can move. Try taxing all these rich folks in America to take their wealth. Guess what they'll do? They will move. And they'll take their money somewhere else. And then who are they going to tax? Those who can't move. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. This is 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 16. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly defining the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings. What I call idle, idle babblings is some of the stuff you say on Facebook. People that don't go to church, people that don't stand in any position in the church, but they're criticizing everybody who does go to church. Put down God's church. Constantly put it down. They don't go, they don't contribute, they don't do anything. It's called vain babbles. What's the Bible say to do about it? Shun it. Stay away from it. Don't get involved in it. For they will increase to more what? Ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth. Everybody say, you can stray concerning the truth. Saying that the resurrection is already past and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. Everybody say, this is the seal. This is the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Say it with me. The Lord knows those who are His. The Lord knows who those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from the Amen. Yeah. But in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Now remember when we started out? Study to show yourself approved. Now he's going, okay, you want to be approved by me? Clean yourself up. Clean yourself to be a vessel of dishonor. Then he said, I'll sanctify you, I'll cleanse you, and I will make you useful for my work. Useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid, everybody say, but avoid. But avoid. Foolish, Foolish and ignorant disputes. And ignorant disputes. Knowing that they generate strife. Knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God, perhaps, notice it said, if God, perhaps, will grant them repentance, <coughs> so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses. Everybody say, come to their senses. Come to their senses. And escape the snare of the devil, yes. having been taken captive by him to do his will. Church, can I remind you that the epistles are written to the church. God ain't talking about these sinners out there that have been captured. He's talking about believers. How did they get captured? Why do they need to come to their senses? Because they disobeyed God. Let's read it again. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare. Everybody say the snare. The snare of the devil. Are your finances snared? Is your health snared? Is your peace snared? Are your children snared? Then God says, come to your senses. Your mind. Think right. Amen. Get in my book. Find out what's wrong. Ask me. I'll tell you. 
We have not because we ask not. If things aren't working the way you think they're supposed to work, ask God why. Amen. <coughs> what am I doing wrong? It's not God, it's us. What am I doing wrong? Show me so I can correct it. That's right. Part of the gospel is correction. Showing us where we're wrong so we can be right. That's God right. wants you to have a blessed life, a wonderful life, good things. He don't want to withhold that one thing that's good from you. But you have to do things to get that. And this do nothing gospel where you don't even have to come to church. Don't have to give to the kingdom. Don't have to pray. Don't have to live right. Don't have to do right. I don't have to do nothing. I'm at liberty to live like the Lord and not expect their own results. It's crazy. It's insane. It's not the gospel. It's not true. Everybody say, I want to be set free. I want to be set free. See, the gospel, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What makes you free? The truth. Not a half truth, not a partial truth, but the truth. And the truth is right here in this book. Everything you need in life is right here. Every answer to every problem you have is found within the pages of this book. Am I telling you I don't believe in prophecy? I believe in prophecy. Tremendously believe in prophecy. But they like they got lined up the book. Right? They got to speak in volume with the book. So when you have Christians who don't read the Bible, what do you need to help them? It says, help them, pray for them that they may come to their senses. This morning we're going to pray. Before I, I turn this over to worship, we're going to pray. We're going to pray no more. We're going to keep hammering the, the uh, opposition, the obstruction. Is it still obstructing? It's just a counterattack. Try to get you to stop asking. Try to get you to stop proclaiming what God has said because God can't lie. Sometimes you have to war. Time to war. But we need to pray for our brothers and sisters that they come to their senses. That they come out of the snare of the devil. I don't want people broke. I don't want people struggling financially. I want you to be blessed. But if you're going to be blessed, you might do what God says. Yes. You know, stop trying to buy every new gadget that comes out on the market. You don't have to have the latest cell phone. What's a cell phone cost now? A thousand dollars. A thousand bucks. That's a lot of money. Everybody say that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. But Brother Lee, you don't understand the rising will allow you to just include that in your bill. So it's still a thousand bucks. And if they include it in the bill, it's going to cost you more than a thousand dollars. That's right. Right? Before you make a purchase like that, don't you think it's wise to ask God? Right. That's a major purchase for some people. That's a major pur purchase for me. My cell phone's 10 years old. And yet we have people that really can't afford to buy their groceries. They buy a cell phone. Amen. That's right. That's the enemy has dominated our thinking. We become mindless. Because the enemy paints this picture, we gotta have it. We gotta have it. No, we don't. Janet can't see buttons, so we bought her a little old bitty phone that's probably, I might be paying $20 for that thing. And you know what? It works just as good as mine. You can talk on it just as good as mine, but you can't get Facebook notifications. Yeah, Miss Janet's at peace. She might listen to all that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Father God, we come to you. Come to us for church. Father God, we come to you. Humbly, sir, we ask you to help us. We let some things slip. We let revelations.